Okay, so last class, we sort of set the table for trying to understand the genetic mechanisms of evolution. We spent time thinking about uh, some data situations with respect to the power of random genetic drift, the noise in the evolutionary process, the rate at which mutation gives rise to new variation in the way in which recombination reassorts variation uh, within and among chromosomes and saw that these vary in quite a particular uh, predictable fashion, in fact, co-vary with each other. So now with that background in sort of the power of these different evolutionary forces and keeping in mind they vary by about three to four orders of magnitude, we want now to think about how mutation, selection, and drift all operate together to give rise to evolutionary change. So today's lecture will be the most uh, technical of all the lectures I'll, I'll have to give. I'm uh, glossing over a lot of the mathematical details, rest assured they're there, but I'm trying to get uh, the general points across uh, as best with uh, going at things from a purely verbal fashion. So trying to understand evolution uh, means two things uh, from a theoretical perspective, especially here today. We wanna to think about the rates of change from one population state to another. And then as we'll, we'll see in a second, we wanna also think about the equilibrium status of, of populations over time when things stay constant. So there's two ways to think about rates of change from one state to the other. So I'm just giving you the big picture now and then we'll elaborate a little bit more. And unfortunately my slides are locked up. Oh, here we go. Okay, so first, uh, we wanna think about the progressive response to long-term selective challenges. So imagine a population is exposed uh, to some directionally changing environment. Unfortunately, we're, we're confronted with one of these now, global warming. So there's, imagine there's a gradient of temperature change through time and the population is trying to adapt with it, chasing this uh, environmental change along through time. And one of the questions that we might ask is, how does the rate of adaptive evolution scale with different features of the population, in particular population size? Do large populations evolve more rapidly than small or vice versa? Which classes of mutations are going to contribute most to selection responses? We'll see uh, mutations of small effect are by far the most common, but of course, by the fifth, the fact that they have small effects, they might not be as uh, pronounced in the long run as a few mutations with large effects. Uh, a second approach that we'll take is uh, a bit different here. Uh, we'll be thinking about the, a complex adaptation. This is an adaptation that requires more than one mutation at different genetic loci to give rise to a beneficial effect. And the question here will be, how long does it take? What's the waiting time uh, to some novel beneficial effect to arise? One example of this might be the acquisition of antibiotic resistance that requires more than one mutation in the key gene. And again, uh, a key question here is, are large populations more or less successful at establishing complex adaptations? And we'll see that in some cases, small populations are actually better at doing this than large populations. So the third approach that we'll take uh, after the break uh, today concerns the equilibrium distribution of mean phenotypes. So here we're, we will be thinking about traits that have been under more or less constant selective pressure since the, the traits emerged. So these would be key metabolic enzymes and their efficiencies, for example, enzymes that all organisms use and have used for the same function over evolutionary time, replication fidelity, we've already talked about this a bit, and growth rate potential. Everybody has to, to grow to produce babies. Again, uh, here we'll be looking at the degree to which mean phenotypes evolve, uh, but here we're thinking about them wandering around some optimum value over every evolutionary time and asking the question, how free are things to drift and how does bias mutation play a role here? So just as a uh, uh, hearkening back to last lecture, just to really re-emphasize this issue of effective neutrality and the magnitude of selective effects and why this is important to evolution. Recall that we, we talked about how the probability of fixation, 
of a new mutation scales as a function of the relative strength and the power of random genetic drift. So if these are at a ratio near one, we say that things are roughly in the vicinity of effective neutrality. And if this ratio is much less than one, drift wins and selection is completely ineffective, even if there's differences in the selective advantages of different traits. And if the strength of selection is far greater than the power of drift, then selection wins. So this is something we're quite interested in because if we want to think about the response to natural selection, uh, we need to know what the distribution of mutational effects are. So this is just a, a repeat of a graph I showed before. Again, to the left here, any mutation that has a small enough effect relative to the effective population size is going to just behave as though it's neutral, go to fixation, at the same rate as a neutral mutation. And then we go over to here, if it's a beneficial mutation, it can sweep to fixation at a relatively high probability. But keep in mind that probability is only twice the selective advantage. And here, if it's deleterious, uh, it will be eliminated efficiently. This is just an example of a gene with an intron, which is usually a dangerous thing to have versus an allele without an intron. So that might be a beneficial change at the uh, genomic level. And here we're going from a, a case with no intron to a case of an intron. You're picking up a, a you're making your gene easier to break and you have a bioenergetic disadvantage. So there's a flip side of, of one being removed and the other being fixed in these different contexts. So for genetic drift to impose different barriers to evolution in different lineages, we have to have genes with intermediate uh, mutational effects so that in some cases, large populations, those effects can be felt. And in other cases, small populations, they cannot be felt. And so I'm just going to summarize in a couple slides what we know about the distribution of effects. The big problem we have here is the vast majority of mutations have very, very tiny effects, and they're therefore not amenable to a careful genetic dissection in the laboratory. So we have to get to this problem by indirect inference. One thing that we can say with certainty is that most mutations are deleterious and most have small effects, although I'm speaking loosely with respect to what we mean by small here. One way we can get at this problem is uh, going back to thinking about these things we call mutation accumulation experiments. So this, these are some results from an old experiment done uh, with E. coli lines. 50 lines were started, they were all genetically identical, and then they were streaked and plated on Petri plates every day going through a single cell bottleneck uh, for a a large number of generations. And then periodically the lines were frozen and then they were thawed out. You can cryogenically preserve E. coli. They were thawed out later on and all in a parallel experiment, uh, the growth rates were determined. And what you can see here is over time, uh, so just to back up for a second, the fact these lines are going through bottlenecks of one uh, individual eliminates natural selection as a force unless the the mutation is lethal, uh, every mutation will be captured because once it's in that single individual and these are clonal populations, it's in the line forevermore. So by periodically looking at the growth rate of these lines, you can see that the mean fitness declined essentially linearly through time over a period of about a year here. These lines were uh, passaged every day for about a year. And then the variance among the lines increases. And that's a consequence of different lines just randomly picking up different numbers and different flavors of mutation. So whenever one does these kinds of experiments, you always see the mean fitness go down slowly, suggesting that most mutations are deleterious, but only mildly so. Now, there's another way that one can get at uh, the distribution, the full distribution of mutational effects. This involves genomic data where we go out and, and study large number of individuals and populations and think about the frequency of alternative alleles at different nucleotide sites. Alleles that are neutral or, or uh, have very, very small effects are free to drift to relatively high frequencies, but mutations that are deleterious are never allowed to uh, drift to high frequencies when population sizes are large. And you can use all this kind of ob observation to get what's called the frequency distribution of frequencies of mutations, and then indirectly infer 
what the distribution of selection coefficients ought to be. And I'm skipping over a lot of details here, but um, what we're looking at here are the distribution of mutational effects in different regions of genes in uh, Daphnia, which is a microcrustacean that uh, lives in lakes and ponds. So the red line there, that's the distribution of mutational effects uh, for amino acid replacement mutations in the, the 20,000 or so protein coding genes. And you can see the, the, the x-axis here, again, is this NES. That's the ratio of the power of selection to the power of drift. You can see the peak here is down below one. So that if the ratio is one, it means the power of selection equals the power of drift. And you can see these different regions of genes. So this is intergenic DNA. Uh, the gold and the green are in regions of regulatory DNA. You can see that all these distributions have peaks far, far to the left, which means that the power of uh, drift is overwhelming that of selection. So every indication in this gray area here would be free to drift to fixation, even though it has a deleterious effect. It's mildly so, and therefore it's effectively neutral. We can take a, a look at this, these problems of the, the magnitude of selection coefficients in a different way by thinking about bioenergetics. The problem is, as I said, for mutations that have effects that are down around 10 to the minus, even 10 to the minus three, and certainly 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five, we just can't study them in the laboratory because the effects are so small, it would take such a long time to, to uh, see temporal differences in gene frequencies. But we can, we can estimate from bioenergetics, what the effects of certain kinds of mutations would be. Uh, here I'm talking about mutations that have no functional effect. Uh, the only thing going on is that they're, they're costing the organism something bioenergetically. So the only fully neutral mutations we think would be, say, an AT bond flips, the A mutates to a T, and now we have a TA bond. So there should be no, if these are in neutral regions in the genome, even though nucleotides cost a little bit different, there'd be no net consequence. And the same for a GC to a CG exchange. We know how much it costs to produce a single nucleotide base. And we'll talk about this more uh, in a few lectures, but basically to biosynthesize two bases for Watson, Crick, Pear, and DNA that you need costs about 100 ATPs. Uh, we can also say, well, what if we go for an AT pair to a GC pair? Uh, most nucleotides cost almost the same, but there's about three ATP difference cost in biosynthesis. So this is a pretty small number. And it becomes even smaller when you can consider what the entire energy budget of a cell is. So a typical bacterial cell, I'm just rounding off to an order of magnitude, it costs about 10 to the 11th ATPs to make a bacterial cell. Eukaryotic cells are bigger, 100 to 1,000 fold bigger, and it, it will cost about 100 to 1,000 fold more ATP. So to think about how much pain you feel from one of these kind of mutations, we have to divide by the total cell budget. So again, just rounding off uh, to the nearest order of magnitude, the minimum selective cost of a mutation in the bacterium is about 10 to the minus 10, and the minimum of the eukaryote is about 10 to the minus 13. The point here is that there must be some mutations with very, very tiny effects. And keep in mind that you're effectively neutral if this number is one is less than one over the effective population size, which never gets below 10 to the minus nine. So this is sort of my vague uh, conceptualization of the distribution of mutational effects. So here we're looking in bacteria this is the distribution of deleterious effects of mutations going from one, 10 to the zero, that would be a lethal mutation and going down to mutations of smaller and smaller effect. And it stops here at this 10 to the minus 10. And then this little blue dot, we, this is a log scale, but I put this little blue dot to denote the expected number of these completely neutral mutations. So there's been a lot of work done in protein coding genes and we vaguely expect mutations for amino acid replacement sites to look something like this. This red line here, 10 to the minus nine, is one over 10 to the nine. 10 to the nine is roughly the effective population size of a bacterium. So in bacteria, almost the full distribution 
of mutational effects is to the right and selection can operate on all these quite efficiently. Now, when you go into small any species like us metazoans and land plants, what happens is uh, we still have protein coding DNA and that's illustrated here, but the overall contribution is shrunk because the vast majority of the genome is no longer protein coding. In the human genome, about 98% of the entire genome is non-protein coding, whereas in bacteria, about 98% is protein coding. And so we expect there to be many, many more mildly deleterious mutations in a genome of an animal at a land plant. It goes down to 10 to the minus 13. So now you see, and the gray area here, I, I just demarcated it anything below 10 to the minus six. So that would be where the breakpoint is for effective neutrality in a population size of a million individuals, which is a pretty good size for a, a eukaryote. So now we have this big gray area here of many, many more mutations that are effectively neutral. So that's all I can tell you at this point about the distribution of mutational effects. It's somewhat hypothetical at this point. And you'll perhaps notice that I've only talked about deleterious mutations. I haven't said anything about the form of the distribution of beneficial mutations, which is the subject of most of today's lecture. We might think it's sort of a mirror image with most beneficial mutations having very, very small effect. But again, because beneficials are tiny islands in the sea of deleterious mutations, it's very, very difficult to, to say what their distribution is in any quantitative way. So the big unanswered question in evolutionary genetics. So we're gonna go on to some theory soon, but I just wanna sort of uh, provide a setting for the thought processes we'll go through by uh, looking at this, these results from uh, some E. coli experiments. Rich Lenski has spent his entire life, his entire professional life, passaging 10, 10 mil cultures of E. coli day after day after day. I guess he's probably been doing this for about 40 years now. And when he started this experiment, we couldn't se sequence DNA, but he froze everything away over time. This is uh, uh, what, what happened when people started sequencing the DNA of all these lines after 60,000 passages of E. coli. And I'm showing you results from three different experiments here. In each one of these panels, this would be one 10 milliliter culture. You can see evolution happening on a time scale of a, a few decades. Each one of these lines here is a, a mutation that arose. And if it goes all the way up, it went from a frequency near zero to fixation. And what you can see over time is that there's gradual sort of progressive fixation of different mutations in these lines. You can see it in all these lines with some interesting dynamics that I'll mention in a second. And what happened in these E. coli lines up to this point was that the lines were evolving higher fitness, higher growth rates, about 30% increase in fitness over this 60,000 uh, generation period. A couple things to note here. I've mentioned this before. You can see these small bundles in this top line here going to fixation at the same time. What's happening here is that there's a beneficial mutation that arose on some bacterium's chromosome. There's no recombination. So any other unique mutation anywhere else in the genome would have got pulled along to fixation with the beneficial. So these are called selective sweeps. And the other guys are just hitchhiking uh, with the beneficial mutation. These are often called passenger mutations. This happens in, in uh, cancers that have been studied in, in human biology. You get a mutation that causes a cancer in one particular cell, it expands into a tumor, and any other background mutations that were in that progenitor cell get dragged along as passengers. So this is a very common thing uh, seen in cell biology. Another thing, you can notice here, here's a mutation that, that sort of took off, it got almost a fixation, and then zoom, it gradually was lost from the population. What's happened here, apparently, is another beneficial mutation arose before this went to fixation, and this clone is better than the prior clone, and therefore it displaces it. Another thing you'll notice in this second lineage is here, is now we, wow, we have this bu these two bundles of mutations all behaving. You can even see them oscillating slightly, uh, but 
they're stable through time. Nobody's going to fixation or loss. What's happened here in these cultures is ecotypes have evolved. So we've actually evolved a population that was well mixed to start with, and two ecotypes evolved. One might be a planktonic form, and the other might be a biofilm forming uh, uh, clone that lives on the walls of cells, or there could be cross feeding. So this guy here releases a particular amino acid that this one can't make and vice versa, and they stably support each other. And then finally down here, you'll see suddenly there's this big blob of all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, you'll see that's preceded by a rapid bundle increasing. What's happened in this particular population is a mutator arose. So a cell, an E. coli cell, picked up a, a uh, mutation that created an increased mutation rate hitchhike presumably early on with a rare beneficial mutation that pulled the mutator uh, uh, mutation to fixation and thereby creating lots and lots of, of variation in the future that you don't see back here. So that's sort of a big picture of what really goes on in real organisms in uh, uh, real observable time. So now let's think about, uh, just let me close my door here for a second. Now let's think about some theory. So what we want to think about is that gradual progression of increased uh, fitness. We're going to think about a population of haploid individuals. There's N individuals in the population. Recall there's also a thing we call the effective population size, which is going to be quite a bit smaller typically than the absolute numbers of individuals. We want to think about the rate of increase in fitness, the rate of adaptation. So now we need to think about use of B. That's the rate of beneficial mutations per cell per generation. And then we'll say each of these beneficials has a selective advantage equal to S. So as a benchmark to think about this, let's imagine uh, evolution in a, in a situation where all the mutations are absolutely neutral. So we're, again, following these sort of trajectories through time, like the last panel I just showed you. And here's a mutation. It got lucky. It drifted all the way to fixation. Uh, under neutrality, the time to fixation on average is about two times the effective population size generations. And then you can see while it's moving up, some other mutations came in and just by chance died out. And then finally, after this one fixes, another one comes in and fixes. And uh, there's a certain expected time between fixations under neutrality. This is a haploid population of N individuals. Each one's mutating at rate U. So there's N U mutations arising per generation. Mutations are neutral. So their probability of fixation is simply equal to the initial frequency. There's N individuals, a new mutation arises in one copy. And so the product of these two is the rate of evolution in such a population. N u times one over N, the N disappears, and the rate of evolution is simply equal to the mutation rate. That's a hallmark of what we call the neutral theory, that the rate of evolution is always equal to the mutation rate. It can be explained in this fairly simple way. But we're interested in adaptive evolution here, so we'll go back to the case where our mutations have a selective effect, S. Again, the number of mutations arising per generation is the number of individuals times, in this case, the beneficial mutation rate, which we've seen uh, before is gonna be much smaller than the actual mutation rate because most mutations are deleterious. Now, hopefully you'll recall from last lecture that provided the population is sufficiently large, the probability of fixation of a new mutation is just twice the selective advantage times this discounting term. So this is the ratio of the effective population size to the absolute population size, which is typically less than one. If the two population sizes were equal, this ratio would just go away. Anyhow, that's the probability of fixation. That's the, the number of mutations entering each generation. So the rate of fixation of uh, beneficial mutations over time is just the product of these two numbers. He ends in the numerator, and so the denominator goes away. And the prediction is that the long-term rate of fixation under this ideal model 
is equal to the product of, of four terms, the first just a, a, a number two. But I, I think this will make, I hope this will make some intuitive sense to you. There's three things contributing to the long-term rate of fixation of beneficial mutations. Population size, the more individuals there are, the more mutational targets there are. S, the more advantageous a mutation is, then the more likely it is to go to fixation. And then the beneficial mutation rate, higher the rate of input of beneficials, the more likely you're gonna to proceed towards fixing more mutations. So that has a very simple uh, flavor. This is the simplest evolutionary model one can imagine. And uh, you can imagine it looking something like this. So now we're going from a situation of neutral evolution where it takes a long time for mutations to fix because they're just drifting around. Now our mutations are under positive selection. So most mutations, even if beneficial, will go extinct really relatively quickly uh, just because of sampling error. But when one catches on to a relatively high frequency, zoom, it goes to fixation. This is an algebraic expression for the time to fixation. We don't have to worry too much about. Uh, but the point is that you get these fixations much more rapidly than you get with weak selection. And then the time between subsequent uh, fixations is just one over the rate here. So that's where that number comes from. So that's sort of a picture of what would happen if uh, an organism was confronted with a progressive selective challenge and just kept moving forward and forward and forward over evolutionary time, changing some uh, environmental change like global warming, if you like. But there's some uncertainties here. This is the formula that we I just showed you, has a nice intuitive feeling, as I mentioned. If all other things were equal, this expression would tell us that we expect large populations to evolve more rapidly than smaller populations in terms of fixing adaptive mutations. But there's a couple of problems here. You hopefully recall from last class that we showed that there, there's an inverse relationship between the evolved mutation rate and the effective population size. As a consequence, if the mutation rate is inversely proportional to NE, the product of the two things stays relatively constant. So that will, would eliminate the effect of uh, population size here because N times U would be roughly constant. Another thing to think about, smaller organisms have higher NE, but they also have very, very much shorter generation times. Bacterial generation times can be the order of uh, a few minutes, 20 minutes or so. Whereas of course the human generation times are near 20 years. The expression that I've been, we've been talking about up to now is the evolutionary rate per generation. But you could argue, if you wanna put this on an absolute time scale, which is the time scale that we normally study things, that this compensatory effect would lead to a situation in which um, smaller organisms would have uh, higher rates of, of evolution, even if the product n times u remained constant. And then there's this other interesting question that people have been struggling with for a while. And that is, uh, there really isn't just one flavor of mutations with one value of selective advantage. There's this whole distribution as we just saw. And the question is, of this distribution of mutations, uh, which ones contribute more to long-term fitness improvement? What we saw is that mutations with small effect are much more numerous, but of course their effect is smaller. If we wanna think about your contribution to fitness improvement, we have to multiply the rate by the effect. And now we've got an S squared in here. And of course, as S gets smaller and smaller and smaller, S squared gets really small. So that's the issue is mutations of very small S might be more numerous, but they have this very low, uh, level of S squared. And of course, if S is too small, then uh, it can't be selected on at all. So there's some vague idea that mutations of intermediate effect might contribute most uh, to evolutionary progress in the long term. But what we mean by intermediate, of course, is going to depend on the, the power of random genetic drift. Let me just check where we are at this point. Okay. So 
I'm going to uh, shift now to our second way of thinking about uh, complex adaptations. So the way we've been thinking about evolution up to now, we've been thinking about mutations just progressively coming in fixation after fixation after fixation. But we've been assuming that their effects are more or less independent of each other. But that need not always be the case. So for example, imagine there's two genetic loci here. And we start with a haplotype, little a, little b. So it's a haploid population. Little a might mutate to a big A, but big A doesn't like living on a background with little b. So there's a selective advantage. Your fitness has been reduced by an amount S sub d. Little b might mutate to a big B, but big B doesn't perform so well when it's on a little a background. So it's also suffering this deleterious effect. On the other hand, if we could get big A and big B together, that would be a good thing because they like each other very much. And now we have a fitness that's even greater than the little a, little b. So this is called epistasis. So there's non-additive interactions between the allelic uh, contribution at the two genetic loci. They, don't, they behave in a way that's not uh, independent. There's many examples of this kind of evolution going on. So here would be a, a hopefully a semi-familiar example. So many of our RNAs, the ribosomal RNAs, and even uh, tRNAs, and even messenger RNAs often fold up into stem and loop-like structures. And these stems consist of Watson-Crick pairs, so GC, UA, we're, we're speaking in uh, RNA now, so we have a U in there instead of a T, GCCG. So you have these Watson-Crick pairs producing these stems. Now, what people noticed uh, quite a long time ago is if you sequence uh, things like ribosomal RNA in different species, you'll have the same structure, same length of a stem and so on, but you'll often note that, okay, this species has a GC here, but another one has a UA in that same position. And that uh, invokes a puzzle here. So it's, you get a good bond between an A and a U, a good bond between a G and a C. How do you flip from one state to another? You would have to go, for example, uh, one way to get from here to here would be the A mutates to a G, but now the G is trying to bond with a U. That can be done, it's a weak bond. Uh, and then the U mutates to a C and we're back over to here, or it could, uh, the G could mutate back. But the point here is there's an intermediate deleterious state. We see these things flipping, have flipped uh, from one state to another over evolutionary time, but how do we get through this intermediate bottleneck of reduced fitness? That's the, one, the, the thing we wanna discuss uh, today and with a little bit of theory thrown in. There's many other examples of this, uh, ways to look at it. This is, uh, as an example, uh, this is a, a phylogeny of mammals, and we have frog as an outgroup here. And uh, this is just one of many, many human disease examples. Uh, what people have noticed is that there are cases in which we know a particular amino acid substitution in humans causes a debilitating disorder. So here we're, we're talking about the a, a gene called the androgen receptor gene. And if you look at rabbit, dog, hyena, pig, human, almost everybody has a, a glycine residue at this particular position. If that glycine mutates to a serine, this causes uh, major problems. So it's highly, highly deleterious. Interestingly, however, you look in mouse, the rodent lineage here, and they're fixed for this serine mutation. So if this is highly deleterious in every other context, so deleterious that everybody is stuck with a glycine, how could this happen in mouse? There must be a compensatory mutation somewhere else in the protein that renders this uh, less deleterious, possibly even beneficial. There are many other examples of this uh, in fruit flies and, and humans. So these are called compensatory pathogenic deviations, if you like. So something must be compensating for the switch to serine at this site. Something must be compensating elsewhere. Lots and lots of other examples of co-evolving sites in cell biology uh, that are able to wander around over evolutionary time. So for example, 
many proteins will learn assemble as multimers, not just as one polypeptide chain, but bonding with a product of another genetic locus. And there's going to be this binding interface. And there have to be certain residues along the interface that interact in appropriate ways uh, to maintain that, that binding strength. But they're able to wander. Often when we'll see different amino acid uh, compensatory mutations going on. Transcription of genes involves things called transcription factor binding sites. They're often small motifs like this one here. And a transcription factor has a particular flavor of binding site it likes and will, so it's not binding inappropriately at other places in the genome. Transcription factor binding sites are also able to wander over evolutionary time. That must mean that the transcription factors preference must also change over time. And you can think about many other uh, cell signaling things going on, the processes we call signal transduction, ways that organisms uh, sense their environments, Vesicle traffic in, in eukaryotes is a very, very complex orchestrated uh, cellular phenomenon with many, many different languages going on. And the point here is these languages can drift through time. You could sort of think about these as like uh, dancing on a dance floor in the old days where people held on to each other and when they would dance across the dance floor. And they're adhering to each other in a special way, but they can wander all over the dance floor. So that would be like changing your position or your relative sequences, but each one is evolving in a coordinated fashion with the other one. So that would be a co-evolutionary dance, if you like. Now, what epistasis implies is that we have a, what's called a fitness landscape. This is a purely metaphorical way of thinking about evolution that has different peaks and valleys. And so that means that some peaks might be higher than other peaks. And then there's valleys here, but the way natural selection operates, it's always trying to pull you up the nearest peak. And so you'd like to be here, that's got the highest possible fitness, but imagine you start over here someplace. Well, selection will bring you up to, the, to Mount A peak here, but to get over to here, you have to go through a valley, a reduction in fitness, and that's not how natural selection operates. So if you started to move down here, selection would pull you back up. So the big question here is how can you make a peak shift from one suboptimal peak to one really good peak? And this is just a three-dimensional way of thinking about the problem. You'd like to be over here, but how do you get there when you have to navigate all these valleys and fitness? The only way you can get there the argument often goes is to go through a bottleneck in fitness. And the argument often made is that the only way to go through a bottleneck in fitness is to go through a population size bottleneck so that you simply wander across the valley by random genetic drift, avoiding the, the problems of selection. But of course, small population sizes are subject to vagaries in the environment, extinction, and so on. Anyhow, this is the classic way of thinking about peak shifts. Here's another way to think about the problem that shows in large enough populations, in particular in large populations, it's possible to navigate these peaks without ever going through a bottleneck in fitness. Now imagine we have a small population and uh, imagine we need three mutations to get to a beneficial trait, which will be illustrated by green here. If we have a very small population, we're starting with this white state and eventually a, a blue mutation comes along and it goes to fixation. So this, the width of this line, if it, it goes from top to bottom means we're fixed for this particular type. This is often called a Muller plot. So the population slowly became fixed for the blue type, but we need to get a red mutation and a green mutation to get where we wanna get going. So now we have a secondary red mutation. It sort of increases briefly and declines. The red mutation is actually deleterious here. Here's another one that came up independently, increases and declines. And finally, something happens and this deleterious mutation goes through a string of some lucky generations of sampling and goes to fixation. Uh, so now we're up to a point we've got a bottleneck in fitness, actually. We haven't even yet gotten to the point where the next mutation that we desire has arisen. But now imagine a population that's really quite enormous. 
because the population size is, is quite enormous, there's many mutational targets in the population size. So these blue mutations are arising all the time. Some of them are expanding. And in expanding with these bubbles here, occasionally one of the blues is producing a red, such as up here. But these reds are almost always there. The population is so large that virtually all mutations are, are almost always there. And what you can see is these red guys are expanding or contracting. And then here's a lucky red number two mutation arises and boom, it gets hit with the third mutation, which is really good. Having two is bad. So, but these are kept rare. So the population's not greatly suffering from the two type mutation. And then suddenly this guy comes along creating a three mutation variant that sweeps the fixation quickly. This phenomenon is called stochastic tunneling from a word often used in the, the physics language. The point here is that this beneficial three mutation haplotype has been able to go to fixation in a sufficiently large population, not a small population. And it's done so without bringing the population through a bottleneck in fitness. So you can make these peak shifts not in large, not so much in small populations as you can in sufficiently large populations is the idea here. So let's think about this in a more formal way. We start with the haplotype here. We're gonna think about uh, the case like the RNA stems here. We're going from a case of deleterious intermediates and the end states are completely neutral with respect to each other. And we have a diploid population. So we have two sites here. They're each mutating at rate U to a bad mutation. So there's two haplotypes that can come out at this point. These haplotypes are bad, so they're being removed by selection. But we have a constant input by mutation and a constant output by selection. So these will be retained in a large population by what we call selection mutation balance. The frequency of these types is simply equal to the ratio of the rate of input to the rate of output. So this is a standard thing that goes on in, in genetics. This is why there's many, many deleterious alleles in the human population. They're deleterious, they're kept at low frequency by recurrent input uh, by mutation. So then what can happen under uh, the, the pr prior view with intermediate uh, deleterious mutations that these are kept at this frequency at each site. There's two sites, so that's where the two comes in. And there's two N gene copies. We have a population size of N and it's diploid. So the product of these is the number of copies of these intermediate alleles always just floating around in the population. And what we wanna do is figure out what's the probability of crossing this valley to the other side. Each of these sites is mutating, the, the non-mutated site is mutating at rate U. So uh, given that we move to the other side, it's a neutral end state. Probably a fixation is one over two N. The product of all these is then the probability of, of moving from this state to this state on the other side. Just the product of all these, the N goes away. It's simply equal to twice the mutation rate squared divided by the selective disadvantage. It's completely independent of the population size. The population size disappeared here, but you note here, SD is in the denominator. So the more and more deleterious these are, the less likely it is you're going to make this transition to the other side. So again, the, you know, there's a lot of algebra here, but the main point is it, it takes an understanding of the relative contributions of these different forces of drift, mutation, and selection to understand the likelihood of a certain kind of evolution in different population genetic contexts. So we just looked at the situation here. We started with uh, this white, white type here, AB. First mutation is deleterious. The second one gets you over here. It's beneficial compared to these, but it's same fitness as here. But you can imagine other scenarios Again, first mutation is deleterious. The second one's actually advantageous. So little a, little b is even better than this one. 
So that's going to change things because it's being promoted by selection. And then here's a third possibility. Maybe the first mutation is just completely neutral. But again, the second one's advantageous. The main point I want to make here is this changes the probability of going from here to here. So I just worked out this result for you here. No population size is involved in this expression. Now we're going from here to here. In this case, there is a population size. You may recall that uh, from our, our very first uh, theory slide here is that the probability of uh, the rate of fixing a beneficial mutation is proportional to NE in this particular case. So now we have a population size in here, and there's also a beneficial uh, selection coefficient in here. And then finally down here, uh, there's, there's no deleterious effect here, so that goes away. And the probability of making this shift, again, is proportional to the population size and the mutation rate. But let's return to our assumption that the mutation rate is inver evolves to be inversely proportional to NE. So here we don't see an NE, but in large populations, the mutation rate's really going down. The rate's going down proportional to one over NE. So this whole rate is proportional to one over the effective population size squared. That means that very rapidly as NE gets bigger, it's impossible to make this kind of transition. Here we have a one over NE squared times an NE. The rate of transition to a beneficial is proportional to one over the effective size squared. So even though it's good to get over here, because of this bottleneck, intermediate bottleneck and fitness in large populations, it's hard to do this. And then finally down here, we have NE times the mutation rate, which is a constant roughly. And this kind of evolution would be independent of population sizes. So you can see the main point I'm trying to make here is these different kinds of evolution have different probabilities depending on the population genetic environment. So uh, I'm gonna take a break in just a second, but I'll, I'll just close this section with a couple of other things to worry about. I just gave you this simple example of just one intermediate state, but of course you could have a haplotype that requires two mutations to get over here and so on, or three or four or five to, to make a benefit. And that raises the question, how fast, uh, how much do things slow down in these particular cases? And there's a lot of theory here that I won't go into today, but it, it can be shown that often, uh, even adding intermediate steps, um, the rate of origin of a complex type is, is proportional to no more than the square of the mutation rate. One issue is that when you have more and more intermediate states, there's more pathways to get over here. So that partly compensates uh, for the increased number of steps that have to be taken. <clears throat> Another possibility illustrated here, we haven't talked about <clears throat> up to now, we generally think of mutations as arising independently uh, across the genome. But what we've learned over the past few years is often when one mutation arises, another one arises on the DNA in the near vicinity. This might be due to just occasionally a bad polymerase jumping down in the DNA and making multiple mistakes, but we call these multi-nucleotide mutations. So this AB in a single mutational step might jump right over and bypass completely this intermediate state to the little a, little b type, which is really good. So we have to keep in mind that those possibilities exist, especially in enormous populations. You could argue in a bacterial population of 10 to the 20 cells, double mutations are arising every generation with somebody. And then finally, there's this issue of recombination. So if we had this and there was recombination going on, there's a lot of these guys. This guy's a little island in the sea of these. If you recombine with these, you're basically eliminating the advantage uh, by the rate of, of recombination. So recombination in general does not move things forward in a uh, beneficial way. And in fact, it can often inhibit the recombination rates high enough. You could just never stay over here because you'd be recombining back and forming these deleterious intermediates. So those are just some things to think about, things that need to be worked out in, in future theory. So I'm gonna take a break uh, quickly here to find out if there's any uh, questions that have accumulated. <clears throat> 
what's going on here is that the population is so large that all mutations are arising each generation. So these, these red guys, if they're by themselves, are deleterious. That's why they're normally dying out. But if one gets lucky enough to pick up the green mutation on top of the red, these are three different nucleotide sites, then away you go. So the point here is that in large enough populations, all these intermediate haplotypes will always be maintained there just by a recurrent mutation. In small populations, mutation rate might be the same, uh, but the population size is so small, there aren't many mutational targets. So it's only a rare occasion that one of these will arise. And then there's not a long enough time because this will be eliminated or drift to, to loss relatively quickly. There's not enough opportunities for this green mutation to arise. Whereas back here, almost every generation, there's some opportunity for it to arise. Does that help? Yes, that helps. So, so is it fair to say that in those earlier um, instances of that stochastic tunneling where the red got selected out, there were different passenger mutations that just happened to select those individuals out of the population? You're talking about this graph here? Yeah, the stochastic tunneling graph. Yeah, I mean, there could be other flavors going on. For example, this one might arise over here. I didn't illustrate it but it wouldn't elicit any advantage. It's a good way to probably re rethink this. Uh, it, would, it, it would be d disadvantageous unless it arose on the red background. Okay. Okay, so this is a situation we have to have a combination of blue, gr red, and green to have an improvement. So it's like a three-way epistasis, if you like. Yes. Okay, so let's uh, move on to the You'll note that what we've been focusing on up to now is a situation uh, in which we're thinking about the rate of evolution from one state to another or just a progressive improvement in fitness over time. But we want to now switch our thought process to thinking about a situation in which the population or the trait has been under long term selection perhaps under the same selection pressures in every, any organism over evolutionary time. So replication fidelity, for example, or catalytic efficiency of, of, of some key enzyme. And then what we want to think about is over time, to what extent is this mean phenotype able to wander around to take on different values, deviating from the optimal value? So here, we're not thinking about dynamics any, any longer of allele frequency change very much. We're thinking about the long-term steady state probability distribution of alternative phenotypic states with the idea that populations are wandering uh, from one state to another. So I'll start with the simplest way of thinking about this, very simplest. There's just haploid population in one allele. The big A allele will say that's the best state and then the little a allele, which is somewhat deleterious. Population can be roughly fixed for this type or this type. And then there can be transitions from one type to another. So here, the mutation rate from big A to little a is U. Mutation rate from little a to big A is V. It's a uh, diploid population. So there's N individuals, each containing two genes. And so that's the rate of production of little a population level from big A. To make the full transition, we have to multiply the rate of origin by the probability of fixing the mutation. In this case, we'd be fixing a deleterious mutation. And vice versa, the net pressure from here to here is the rate of origin times the probability of fixation. In this case, we'd be fixing a beneficial allele. Now, if you think about this in a long-term timescale issue, uh, say over millions of years, in principle, population can be wandering back and forth from one state to another. This is a long-term, what we call steady state distribution, but at equilibrium, the rate of movement from big A to little a has to be exactly equal to the rate of 
transition from little a to big A. This is what we call detailed balance. There'd be an equilibrium distribution. Now this might rub you the wrong way in some way mathematically, but uh, it, it makes sense verbally. This deleterious state here is going to be very, very rare because it's deleterious, but when it exists, it, it will zoom back to the beneficial uh, state at a high rate because of probably fixing a beneficial mutation. On the other hand, this one's very common. It will be the most common state and only rarely will, will it, it move over to here. So the net effect is that the, the flux rate from here to here is equal to the flux rate from there to there. And uh, you can do a little bit of math and uh, end up with a very, very simple result. The probability of being fixed for this allele is equal to one over uh, one plus this quantity here. And what is this quantity here? Well, beta is the mutation pressure towards the beneficial type relative to the deleterious type. Beta is, is B, the reverse mutation rate over the forward mutation rate here, if you like. And then E to the S, that's just the ratio of the power of fixation of a beneficial versus a deleterious. And that S here has a familiar form here. It's four times the effective size times the uh, power of selection. Remember S times N is the ratio of the power of selection to the power of drip because the power of drip is one over NE. So this has a very neat flavor. It's telling us that the probability of being in one state versus the other is just a function of one composite parameter here, which is just the net pressure in this direction versus that direction. Nothing more to it than that. So it has a nice intuitive feeling again. This is the mutation pressure over to here, and this is the selection pressure over to here. And so what will happen with a situation like that as, as you get to larger and larger population sizes, uh, S is, uh, in, that big S is increasing and so if you had a mutation with a, a fairly large effect, you would zoom up with an increasing population size to near fixation. Intermediate effect, you have to have a larger population to get to fixation and still a smaller effect. Population size has to be still larger. So you get these sort of gradients and the, this would be the frequency, the fraction of time the population is fixed for the beneficial type big A versus the deleterious type little a. And things get more complicated if we move to a situation in which our genes are linked together. Because recall that what linkage does is it reduces the effective population size. It makes the population behave as though it's smaller than the ecologist would tell us it is. So here's the preceding graph. But if now we have mutation it's arising at different sites, but they're all glued together, uh, natural selection gets confused. So for example, here's four haplotypes. They're all different genetically, but each one has three beneficials and two deleterious. And so the net effects of these haplotypes is all the same. And natural selection, if they're linked, cannot operate on the individual sites uh, based on their own individual benefits. That glazes the eyes of natural selection over and it stretches these to become a more gradual uh, uh, a more gradual transition from a low rate down here. Down here, everything's just governed by mutation pressure alone. This is where you would go if there was no selection and then selection pulls you up, but more slowly as things become more and more linked. Now let's extend this uh, to multiple loci in a, a slightly different way. So here we have multiple locus traits. This might be something I, I like to call these digital traits. This might be something like a transcription factor binding site. And suppose it's transcription factor, like suppose there's just plus and minuses here. Uh, and the transcription factor really likes to have all pluses. That's a good match to the transcription factor. And this is really bad. These are all the alternative states. And this becomes important with respect to this multiplicity problem. There's four ways to have uh, one plus. There's six ways to have two pluses, four ways to have one minus, and only one way here. So this becomes sort of an attractor over evolutionary time. So 
Now we ask, what's the probability of being in one of these alternative states over time? There's these transitions from one state to another, these stepwise transitions up and down. And without going through the algebra, I'll just say that each of these arrows pointing in the down is we can predict what the probability of the population is in any of these states over evolutionary time. It turns out to be a Poisson distribution. Those of you taking statistics will know what the Poisson distribution looks like. And it's governed again by this one parameter. The good news, there's only one parameter involved. The bad news is that one parameter contains information about mutation, drift, and selection. But here I've shown you what these distributions would, would look like. As this quantity gets larger and larger and larger, these distributions shift further and further to the right. And this is an example where it's really good to be very far, far over to the right, but mutation keeps moving you back to the left and you get this kind of equilibrium. There's three points I wanna make with respect to these results. One is that here we'd be looking at a population where many populations all having the same mutational selection and drift parameters but you can see there's a, a wide range of possible phenotypes. There's phenotypic variation, even under uniform selection. Something to think about uh, when we go out and try and match phenotypes to some evolutionary expectation and think every difference that we see in biodiversity is due to selection. Here, everything's under uniform selection and diverges at a certain level. Also, the most common state is not necessarily the optimum. Here, the optimum is way over here and nobody ever gets there, again, because of this uh, mutation pressure. Now, under effective neutrality, NS would be equal to zero because S is zero, and this term goes away entirely, and the form of the distribution is completely independent of population size and just governed by the mutation pressure alone. So I'm gonna sum up at uh, this point mainly focusing on the last few points I, I've been making with respect to these distributions of phenotypes. Uh, we commonly like to think that populations under identical selection pressures will evolve to be highly similar phenotypically, but we've seen there's many plausible situations in which uniform selection, when combined with drift and mutation bias, can lead to substantial divergence among lineages under the same selection and sometimes more than we'd expect, even with drift alone. So this raises questions about the common sort of procedure in evolutionary ecology, assuming that all mean phenotypes are some kind of telling us something about what natural selection is wanting us to do. I'm not saying that this is an entirely invalid approach by any means, but we do need to be careful because drift can play a role in phenotypic diversification. The drift barrier hypothesis predicts that the mean phenotypes will sometimes exhibit gradients uh, with the level of approach to molecular perfection increasing with the population size because that makes natural selection more efficient. Mutation bias can push mean phenotypes towards a region that's different than the position where selection is pushing you. Sometimes it can reinforce prevailing selective pressures if the mutation bias happens to be operating in the same way, but other times it can conflict with ongoing selection pressures. And what's important to realize is even if mutation is unbiased, it will still influence the distribution of mean phenotypes because of this multiplicity problem. So back here, for example, uh, mean phenotypes will tend to gravitate to a situation like this, simply because there's many more paths to that than to these other positions. So just with complex uh, characters with many, many contributing factors, you will tend to gravitate to situations that are more accessible mutationally, even if mutation itself is unbiased. And that's uh, it for today. If there's any uh, questions at this point, we can finish up with some questions. I don't see any questions now, I think. Mm. Okay, so I think uh, we can wind up for today. Thanks, Mike. You're so welcome. We'll, yeah, so we'll see you on Friday, oh, Friday morning.
Uh, yes, I think that's my Thursday evening. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, two days from now. Right. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for the slight mess up. We, we still haven't figured out how to get those pictures. Yeah. Hidden up in the right hand corner, but. But I, I, I hope uh, because I've sort of slightly more uh, wanted to look at this model again a bit. Uh, the one that you s s talked about this multi, you know, multiple lo locus problem. Yeah. Uh, is it in the PowerPoint presentation? Because I sort of missed some details there. Oh, the solution? Yes. Yeah, uh, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's published in an earlier paper. Yeah, my, right, 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 um, right. Yeah, I think I need to look at it again. Okay. Yeah, I'll try to recall that. Yes. Okay. Yeah, in the simplest case, the uh, in small populations, those transition coefficients mm -hmm. are, are just the... Uh, that's what got stuck. So the, hmm. um, if you go back to the thing with all the pluses and minuses, uh, the point I wanted to make was that the probability of any one of those, I guess, uh, four or five haplotypes groups, it's just equal to the coefficients on the, the product of the coefficients on the arrows pointing up and pointing down. So yeah. it has a nice, simple way. You, you need to know what the coefficients are, of course. But. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, so the phenotypes that are favorable are the ones sort of, which is more entropically favor, which have yeah, had yeah. problems. Yeah, that, that's what right. the so, term you guys that, would use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, but I thought there was some uh, things which were not understood about that model, but uh, I forgot, <laughs> I'll have a look at it. I think you have this paper, right? In yeah, I think that that might be in a paper that I published with uh, Kyle Hagner in PNAS. Okay, okay. And it's also explained in uh, the book chapter that I, I sent as a PDF for the students. All right. So okay. the derivation's in there. Okay, I'll have yeah. it. Uh, any questions, clarifications, anything? Okay, fine. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. See, See you in two days. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah,